That way I don't have you sit and then stand again. And you're standing for the honor of the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 17. I must say to you this morning that it is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. It is a joy to be saved and born again in the blood of Christ. Amen. Matthew chapter 17. Begin with me if you will. Reading in the very first verse. Matthew 17 verse 1. The Bible says, And after six days, take Peter, James, and John, his brother, <clears throat> bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his faith did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice of the cloud which said, or behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, again for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for the chance to be here, to serve you, to hear from your word. Lord, we thank you for the souls that are present this morning. Lord, I ask you to go forward, power and might of the Holy Spirit of God, and make a difference in the lives of those that will hear this message. Make a difference in the lives of those that are present. Father, we ask for your touch today, and we need it greatly. To all the glory and praise and honor we give the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we ask these things today. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. I do thank you for your patience and standing, both in song and in reading this morning. But I want to talk to you just a little bit today. I want to, I want to bring a particular topic to you this morning on just... just just a point on this subject, an intense proclamation, an intense proclamation. I mean, this here, what we just read here this morning, this will be a day in history like none other before. A day that would, that would be spoken about for generations to come. As a matter of fact, it's a day that is still spoken about in our world. Nearly 2,000 years later, we are still talking about what we read right there in the transfiguration of our Lord and Savior. My friend, this will be a day that would not only be written about, it would be debated over, it would be a question of its authority, it would be a day, my friend, that would shake up the minds of those uh, that would hear about it and cause those that missed it to swell with great questions. This would be a day of joy. Obviously, it was a day of fear. This was a day that occurred like none other. And there was an intense proclamation that was not only made this day, but a point was built upon as well. Guys, it's no mistake that the transfiguration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took place after the experience in Caesarea Philippi. See, Jesus Christ, after six days, would take a two-day journey with Peter, James, and John up until now, apart from everyone else, apart from all of the others, where these men would receive a small glimpse of the glorified Christ. Now, just for to eliminate distractions uh, purposes only, you may ask, well, why, why is Moses and why are Elijah there? Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses spoken about in the book of Revelation. They are the two witnesses that preach uh, for 1260 days or 42 months, three and a half years, uh, the same, no matter how you calculate it, the same length of time. And they preached during that, that Daniel's 70th week, they preached during that seven year tribulation period on this earth, or the first part of it, and then they were beheaded for the cause 
of the Antichrist, basically. They're beheaded for the cause of Christ. Ultimately, we understand that. But they're beheaded because of the Antichrist. And, and uh, they, they, of course, lie in the streets for three days. And all of a sudden, we find after three and a half days, they're resurrected. We talked about that this past Wednesday night. So we can get past the fact that Moses and Elijah are there and get into three simple points this morning that I want you to see in this topic of an intense proclamation. We want to know that this, see, this day in history, my friend, th this day in history is called the Mount of Transfiguration. This location in Israel where Jesus Christ took these three men up into this high mountain apart from everyone else and just for a moment in time was transfigured into his glorified appearance. It was a place, my friend, number one, became where a future be held. It was a, it became a place where a future was beheld. In the first three verses, the Bible says, and after six days, Jesus take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was, was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. It must have been a sight of all sights. It must have been a glorious sight that day to witness the transformation, the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ with his face shining as the sun, with his raiment as white as light. Now, I honestly believe that, that our finite minds this morning uh, cannot, cannot really imagine the splendor of that day. I wish that we could. I mean, I don't think we can truly picture the, this light that his clothes were, uh, that his raiment was, was, was appearing as. That this light was so pure, so perfect, so pristine, uh, that it must have pierced the hearts and minds of the men that witnessed it. Sure, Peter wanted to make three tabernacles. I understand that. But we throw Peter under the bus all the time because he does this and he does that. But we're more like Peter than we are Paul in our, many of our ways. Amen. I mean, I, I can't imagine if we'd have been caught up in that moment as we see Jesus Christ, the, uh, the man that they've been following all these years, these times. And, and all of a sudden, his body, his face was, was altered completely. His countless change into appearance that men have never seen up until that moment. The Father in heaven took care of the three tabernacle deal. He rebuked that. We understand it. <laughs> but I want you to put yourself in their shoes. You know, the Bible says that after six days, Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain. If you read Luke chapter 9, verse 28, you'll find out that it says, that, and roughly after, and about eight days later, uh, they went up there, Christ was transfigured. And what it is, it's six days after the moment, but it was a two-day journey up into that high place. Where he was transfigured. So the, the scripture is not contradicting itself by any means. It was after six days of the events of the Caesarea Philippi experience. But it was a two days journey where they went apart from the rest of the crowd. And up on that mountain, up there, up on Nebo, up on this high mountain, Jesus Christ just all of a sudden just was transfigured before them. Think about the things that they had experienced just for the past eight to ten days. Think about how their life has changed. Think about so much information they were given. So much learning, so much relearning, so much correction had changed in the ministry just in over a week's time, if that. Jesus Christ would, would ask them the question and they would say, well, the world says you're one of the prophets. The, uh, they say you're one of the, uh, John the Baptist. They say you're this, say you're that. And, uh, well, who do you say I But who, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers correctly and answered prayer that Jesus Christ made on his behalf to the Father. And the Father bore witness with him. And what happened was that Jesus Christ uh, saw that Peter made a proper confession that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you know, my Father revealed this unto you. And then he says he makes a prophecy of a church that he was going to build soon upon himself. And then all of a sudden he says, but Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And then he says, but tell no one. He charged the disciples to tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And the entire direction of the ministry of Christ before the eyes of these men began to change. 
It went from this kingdom mentality to this cross mentality. Jesus Christ had changed so much in these past days. We know that he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan. He began to teach them of what profit it would have, if, if the kingdom did come in, but there was nothing to atone for their sin, what would it profit you? They would lose your own soul at the end of the time. But now six days later in a two day journey, they get to see the son of man transfigured of what he will be like one day when he's the king of kings. The Lord reveals just a taste of what is to come when Jesus Christ is made Lord of Lords, when Jesus Christ is made King of Kings, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. Just a little taste. It's an intense proclamation this day. These men, the men, the lives of these men for all practical purposes, have been turned completely upside down. There was a future that they beheld. But just as much as a future that was beheld on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was the confirmation that a forerunner was beheaded. Look there in verses 10 with me, pick up where we, where we stopped this morning. And the Bible says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come, uh, sh uh, shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. It was John, the six-month elder cousin of Jesus Christ, who made the opening proclamation of Jesus Christ as the wonderful Lamb of God, given way to his earthly ministry that would last only three and one-half years, but would change the entire world. Look over in John chapter 1 with me. John chapter 1. If you turn to John chapter 1, look down around the mid part of the chapter. We're going to look at verse 26 through verse 30. The Bible says here, John 1, verse 26. This was a day, my friend, where a reference was made of a forerunner that was beheaded. Answered their question that Elias had already come, but why? John chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, Jesus answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but, but, uh, but there, um, I'm sorry, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stand there, there standing one among you who ye know not. He it is who coming after me is the preferred before me, whose shoe latchet, shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in, um, in uh, Beth Arba, beyond uh, Jordan, where John was baptized. And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. It was John the Baptist, this rough and tumbled uh, preacher, this, this man from the wilderness, this, this man who, who made a great and wonderful proclamation, opened up the doorway uh, for Jesus Christ to have his public ministry, opened up the doorway for Jesus Christ to fulfill Scripture. His Christ's disciples that we just read about Matthew 17, uh, they asked the Lord, they say, what about Elias? But why do they say that Elias must first come? Stay in there in John chapter 1. Look up a few verses with me in verse 19. The Bible says that this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art, uh, art thou the prophet? That prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That... Uh, uh, that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Watch this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophets of uh, Isaiah. 
You see, my friend, truly Elias must first come. He must come in the power and the spirit of Elias as it was written. Just as Isaiah said that it would. Just as as Elijah uh, came through. Just as Elisha uh, pushed through in in, in the wilderness. The same spirit, the same thought, the same principles that we find here today must still come in the beginning as a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ to pave the way, to make, make the path of our Savior straight. Open your Bibles, turn back to Matthew, but I want you to go to Matthew chapter 11 with me. Matthew chapter 11. Truly Elias must first come, Christ said. But in Matthew chapter 11, as we look in verse 7, this is what the Bible says. It says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, He says, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaking with the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? He said, Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them, that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now guys, listen. Before you think John was a Baptist, as in what we refer to a Baptist today, that's a, he was a Baptist. He was called John the Baptist because he baptized. That's the only reason. John's not part of the church. John was the best man to stand by at the wedding. Uh, John died before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's not part of the bride today. But truly, that man came. Truly, that man came in the spirit of Elias. That man came to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. That man came to pave the way. That man came to make the path straight. That man came and preached that there was a Lamb of God which came to take the sin of the world away. Amen. The wickedness of this world, the lustful, burning desires of mankind blinded their eyes. And that man was rejected. John's rebuke of Herod for stealing his brother's wife cost him his freedom and eventually cost him his life at the request of that harlot, uh, that harlot and her vile daughter. And this is why Jesus Christ said of this man in the verses that we read, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Whatsoever they desired, they did unto John the Baptist, who came not preaching himself, who came not preaching anything other than paving the way for the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Their actions, my friend, make full proof of the Lord's words, even more accurate from John 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The desires of a man's heart are evil. Passions that are locked away when left uncleansed bring about the most wicked of devices. Unrestrained evil, my friend, to do that which seems right in their own eyes. The wisest man on the face of this uh, on the face of this planet, the wisest man in the history of all mankind, he said this: that there is a generation that appear in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. When the unregenerate are left to themselves, they are left to their own devices to create cruel and wicked manners of life. Uh, when they when they when they are rebuked with just such a small amount of life that is shown upon their deeds, uh, it reveals uh, their true state not only to others but to themselves. But the result, typically, when they expose this wrongdoing, is destruction, not of their sin. but of the light. Rather than getting right, what happens is they seek to get rid of the light that exposed the wrongdoing. And this is what happened to John the Baptist. This is what Jesus Christ is referring to, saying that they they did unto him whatever they listed. They did unto him whatever they wanted to. Had no restraint of what they were going to do to him. And this is he who came in the spirit of Elias, 
as a forerunner of Jesus Christ, making those paths straight before him. Mankind were left to themselves, and they destroyed the one that came to pave the way of our Savior. Solomon said in Proverbs 16 that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You say, preacher, what does all that have to do with where we're going today? So much had happened that we've talked about in the past several weeks. So many things have changed with these disciples and the ministry that the Lord has given them. They had to change their views. They had to change their opinions. They had to change their direction. They had to change everything. And all of them gave up everything that they had in this world. And then all of a sudden, they follow the Messiah. And now he changes the direction. At least in their minds. All of a sudden, they ask the question, why do the scribes say the last must first come and restore all things? And Jesus Christ said, well, Elias has already come. And they knew him not. And they did whatsoever unto him that they listed. They did whatever they wanted to do unto him. We know that John was beheaded. Jesus Christ doesn't stop there. He says, likewise, in verse 12, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. What is he saying? He's saying the forerunner that came before me to pave the way, to make the path straight. They did whatever they desired unto him. They, they beheaded him, put his head in a charger, and put it on display at a party with Herod the Tetranarch because of his vile stepdaughter and vile wife, with his brother's wife. They made a public spectacle out of a man that had rebuked him in front of all. Jesus says, Christ says, likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. What are they saying? They're going to make a public spectacle out of me as well. They're going to do whatever they want to do unto me as well. Just as they did to the forerunner, John. They're going to do to this Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine the news to the disciples. Imagine the news to Peter, James, and John who just witnessed Christ transfigured. Who just saw Moses and Elijah <coughs> stand beside and talk with him. Imagine the news that, that they're receiving now that just like they did to John, he's already come in the spirit of Elias. That's been uh, finished. It's been uh, promised. It's been fulfilled. Now what happens? The focus is still the cross. Christ's carriageway to the cross was the main view. Even though the taste of the glorified Lord was offered just as a foreshadow of that which was to come, it's an intense proclamation that was made, a future beheld, a forerunner beheaded were the topics, but there was still a fulfillment before. Jesus Christ says in verse 9, he says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. There is no doubt as to what the Lord was sharing with his men. There is no doubt that Christ is assuring his disciples of his death and his resurrection. He had reiterated his burial, which, is, which speaks of his death, obviously, in the chapter that we before that we read in Matthew chapter 16. In verse 4, he says, and this is not going to be on your outline up there. Uh, in verse 4, he says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeking after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. What is the sign of the prophet Jonas? You cross-reference that with Matthew in chapter 12. And you look in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40, the Bible says, But he answered and said unto them, uh, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given, uh, given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. While Christ Jesus' body was in that grave, while it was in that sepulcher, while it was in, in that tomb, 
He went to the heart of the earth and preached unto men. He went to the heart of the earth and took captivity captive. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, not on your outline, just listen carefully. He says, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive again, give son to men. Now that he ascended, what is it? Uh, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also descended up far above the heavens that he might feel all things. Yes, there was a forerunner beheaded. Yes, there, there, there was a uh, there was a forerunner beheaded. Yes, there, there were the issues that happened that day. Yes, there were tragedies that laid before them. We understand those things. Yes, there was a future that was beheld and, and a glorified, beautiful future. But there's a fulfillment before Jesus Christ that he's speaking of this day. And his eyes, my friend, are set on the cross of Calvary. He's telling them over there in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 16. He was telling them, charging them to tell no man that I'm the Christ. Amen. Now the focus is the cross. Now he's saying, tell no man the vision of that which you've just seen. Until I be risen from the grave. Peter said, Peter said, not going to happen to you, Lord, when he's over there talking about the things that he must suffer of the, the Pharisees and the scribes and those that are in Jerusalem and be killed and be raised again the third day. Peter uh, gets rebuked by Christ. He's called Satan. says, get behind me, Satan. There is a fulfillment before. My friend, what I'm trying to drive home today <coughs> Jesus Christ had his eyes set on that cross in Jerusalem. He had his eyes set on that cross on top Mount Moriah in a place called the Skull, thus being interpreted from Golgotha. He had a place called Calvary in his mind. He had a place that was foreshadowed all the way back in the book of Genesis when, uh, when uh, Abraham took Isaac up on that hill and went to sacrifice him. And when that boy said, Father, uh, where is the lamb? He said, God shall provide himself a lamb. And at the same time, a ram, I bet, was walking up on the other side of that mountain. And it was imputed unto Abraham for righteousness sake because he believed God. Jesus Christ had his vision, his view focused and set on the cross of Calvary for you and I. That's why he had it focused. That's why the change in Caesarea Philippi. This is an intense proclamation. <coughs> proclamation that he's trying to get the point through <coughs> his disciples' head and into their heart that he is going to suffer the things Worse than John the Baptist because they're going to do unto him whatever they want to do. There's still some that are standing there that heard that that day. They didn't remember his words until after the resurrection. But nevertheless, the Lord confirmed them of his coming out when he would suffer many things and ultimately atone for the sin of mankind and proclaim the victory over death and the victory over the grave and be risen again in eternal greatness and everlasting power. When Jesus Christ is likewise, shall uh, they also, likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. He knew he was going to rise from the grave. He knew that he was going to uh, rise again. He knew that he was going to lay his life down. But there were some things he had to go through beforehand. But I don't think we often, I don't believe we truly, I don't think we truly understand the magnitude of our sin upon the Son of God. The day was fast approaching. Christ was not concerned with, with his cost. Mostly he was concerned in preparing his men. Preparing them for the day and the hour in which the Son of Man would be betrayed. Even in comforting them with the future, Jesus Christ continued to lead them through every step, guiding their minds to fortify their place in the ministry of Christ, laying the foundation that He was going to ultimately lay at the cross of Calvary in the tomb and the resurrection from the grave. Can I say this to you this, this morning? That it is through the power and might of the ministry that the future, the future of the church, the future of the bride, of a new future was beginning to unfold 
before the eyes of Jesus. It was a fulfillment before. A new future, a new chapter of mankind's existence. It was the self-existent eternal one, the eternal God, the everlasting Father. It is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the mighty Counselor, one who is named Wonderful, the Creator of all things, would lay down his life for the souls of mankind. Before he laid that life down, this world, they did with him whatsoever they listed. They did with him whatever they wanted to do. And that's what he's trying to prepare these men for. This is an intense proclamation because he's trying to get their hearts prepared for what they were about to experience. The one that you follow, the one that you proclaim Christ, the one that you are, just saw glorified is the one that's going to be, be betrayed by one that's among us. Is the one that will be arrested falsely and taken into the judgment hall. Is the one that will go before Herod and go before Pontius Pilate. He is the one that will be mocked out and buffeted. He is the one that his beard will be ripped out. That a crown of thorns will be planted upon his head. He is the one that they'll cast a, ro a purple robe around and, and make fun of. Him. He is the one that will bear the, the marks in his body. He is the one that will have the sign up above his name saying King of the Jews. He is the one that will be scourged. Well, when Isaiah said through his, in his stripes, we will be healed. They were more than stripes, my friend. They were brutal lacerations. Brutal flames of his own flesh that was peeled from his back, exposing the bony parts of his body. He is the one that will Refuse the vinegar. He is the one with the seven last sayings on the cross of Calvary. He is the one that when they lay him across that cross beam and nail his hands to a board and his feet to a tree. He is the one that pardons the thief to his side. In his dying moments, Christ takes the time to say, I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. He's the one that thinks of his own mother. In his dying moments, in his final breaths, he thinks of dear Mary and gives her John so that John would take care of her the rest of her days. Beloved, he is the one that on our behalf and those who ignorantly killed him that day, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He is the one that prior to sundown was taken and his body wrapped up and placed into a tomb would never a man had laid. He is that one. He is the one that would, his body would be in there for three days and three nights. He is the one, as already mentioned, that will go to the heart of the earth and take those saints of old captive and preach unto them and proclaim unto the lost the gospel so that they'll be judged correctly. No, they're not saved. Beloved, he is the one but when that three days and that three nights was expired, he is the one that comes out of that tomb. He is one that was spoken of by the man unto Mary. He says, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is the one that shed his blood for you and I, that it may be poured upon the mercy seat in heaven so that all sin of mankind will be atoned for and forgiven and cast into God's sea of forgetfulness, separated from him as far as the east is from the west. He is that one, my friend. <clears throat> Lastly, I close with John 10, 18. You can read it up top. He is the one that proclaimed to Pontius Pilate that no man taketh it from me, speaking of his life. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment, have I received of my Father. You say, preacher, what is that? That right there is your gospel, my friend. Jesus Christ willingly laid his life down. No man stole it from him. 
And since he laid it down, he also took it back. Paul wrote John 10, verse 9, that thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus. He is your Lord. He has to be. And believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It is a fulfillment before following a forerunner's beheading after a future that was beheld. I'm here to tell you this morning, my friend, intense proclamation, lots of changes in the ministry with the disciples this day. But Jesus Christ's central focus at this point is the cross of Calvary. And I can assure you of this this morning, and I'm done. When he made that intense proclamation of what happened, what happened, what happened to him, when he made that intense proclamation that he would suffer the things of mankind as John the Baptist did, and we know that it was even more so. When he made the proclamation that he would go to that cross and he would die, that he'd lay his life down and he'd bring it up again. When he made that, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of me. I believe with every hammer Every hammering of the nails into his hands and his feet. He thought of you and I. You may say, how in the world did he do that? Because he's God. And he knows all things at all times. He knows the beginning. Uh, he knows the ending from the beginning. And I'm just trying to convey this simple thought to you this morning. Jesus Christ loved his disciples enough. That even though it was an intense proclamation, his view was the cross. He wanted to prepare them for the things that were going to happen. And beloved, today, let us never, let us never overlook what happened at the cross. Let us never overlook what happened on this day. It's a glimpse of glory, yes it was. But it was a fortitude. Fortification, if you will, of what the future beheld. Not only the kingdom, but the cross as well. Let's bow your heads, if you will.